saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Great singing, you see it. All righty, good morning. Glad that you're here today. What a beautiful day it has been over the last few days. I love when it gets a little warm in the day and then at night we're sleeping with the windows open, which is a good thing. Well, let's open up in a word of prayer. Father, thank you now as we gather together. What a joy it is to come together to uh, encourage one another, to feed off one another, to, to hear your word, to understand the gospel, to grow in our Christ likeness, to have answers, questions um, that we have answered through your word. Thank you for your word. What would we do if we had to figure this out um, among ourselves? Uh, what a mess it would be. But thank you for the scriptures. Thank you for the 66 books of the Bible that are so clear and, 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 and teach us and show us how we can live and know more about you. Father, thank you for that. Now bless as we uh, worship you today. May it be real from an unfeigned heart. I'm sure there's a lot of things on everyone's minds here, whether it be work, family, friends, situations, life. All those things are real, and you do give them to us. But you also give us the answer, and that is faith, to trust you in each one of these matters. Help that to be the case today as we lay those aside so we can focus completely on you and what you have for us. Thank you now, we pray in Christ's name, amen. All right, so we have our verses here. This is, uh, they're combined together, and these are our two for the month of August. I can't believe that we're already in the month of August. Where did where'd the year go? Tim and I are meeting this week to already discuss next year. And I hate being ahead like that. We're going to be writing down when we're going to have neighborhood Bible time. We just had it, but we're going to be figuring out all those dates and, and what we're doing. That's how fast it goes. All right, let's say our verse together. It says Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Galatians 5, 22, and 23. Let's stand together again, and we are going to sing song 444. I love to tell a story that hymn at the beginning, thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Salvation and the gospel is such a wonderful thing to talk about and to sing about and to praise the Lord for. We're so thankful for salvation. And this hymn, I love to tell the story. It talks all about how we are so amazed, and it's just a wonderful thing for us to talk about what Jesus Christ did for us, the story of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. Let's sing all four verses out this morning. I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory, of Jesus and his love. I love satisfies my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme and glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story more one Tell the old, old story of Jesus. 
Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never heard the message of salvation from God's own holy word. I love to tell the story, twill be my theme in glory, to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. On the last, I love to tell the story, Thank you. We're going to continue singing uh, song number 441, Rescue the Perishing. And if you caught in verse 3 of I Love to Tell This Story, there are many who have never heard the gospel and do not understand the gospel. And in song 441, Rescue the Perishing, we understand that word perishing according to what the scripture says when it says shall not perish, that there is a punishment for sin. And there is a very real eternity. And we will spend eternity somewhere. And the scripture says that we ought to, we teaches that we ought to rescue the parish. We ought to teach the gospel, share the gospel with others. And that's what this song, song 441, Rescue the Perishing, is all about. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. We for the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly, plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie buried that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wake in my kindness. Cords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Let's sing it out on the last. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for your labor, the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way. Patiently with them, tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Great singing, thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. Today's uh, scripture reading is 2 Thessalonians chapter 3. <clears throat> Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free course and be glorified, even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men, for all men have not faith. 
But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. And the Lord direct your hearts into the love of God and into the patient waiting for Christ. Now we command you, brethren, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye withdraw yourselves from every brother that walketh disorderly, and not after the tradition which he received of us. For yourselves know how ye ought to follow us. For we behaved not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for naught, but wrought with labor and travail night and day, that we might not be chargeable to any of you. Not because we have not power, but to make ourselves an example unto you to follow us. For even when we were with you, this we commanded you, that if any would not work, neither should he eat. For we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly, working not at all, but are busybodies. Now let them that are such we command and exhort by our Lord Jesus Christ, that with quietness they work and eat their own bread. But ye brethren, be not weary in well-doing. And if any man obey not our word by this epistle, note that man, and have no company with him, that he may be ashamed. Yet count him not as an enemy, but admonish him as a brother. Now the Lord of peace himself give you peace always by all means. The Lord be with you all. The salutation of Paul with mine own hand, which is the token in every epistle, so I write, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. All right, let's all stand together. We're going to sing our hymn of the month, His Robes for Mine. Stand together and sing. His robes for mine, no oh wonderful exchange. Clothed in my sin, Christ suffered neath God's rage. Draped in his righteousness, I'm justified. In Christ I live, for in my place he died. His robes for mine, what cause have I for dread? Daunting law, Christ mastered in my stead. Faultless I stand with righteous works not mine, saved by my Lord's vicarious death and life. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cause. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. But by such love, my life is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. His robes for mine, God's justice is a peace. Jesus is crushed, and thus the Father's pleased. Christ drank God's wrath. On sin, then Christ is done. Sin's wage is paid, propitiation won. His robes were mine. Let's, let's start again on that fourth verse. On that fourth verse, his robes were mine, such anguish none can know. His robes were mine, such anguish none can know. Christ God's beloved, condemned as though his foe. He as though I, a curse and left alone. I as though he, embraced and welcomed home. I cling to Christ and marvel at the cost. Jesus forsaken, God is strange from God. is not my own. My praise, my all, shall be for Christ alone. 
Thank you very much. You may be seated. All righty, the children may go back with Mr. Tim, and you can follow him. <laughs> Now that's a beautiful sight. Look at all those kids. That's exciting. They're going to yell, scream, and eat sugar. Man, we're doing something wrong up here. We're doing something wrong up here. But I have saved my donut for after church. <laughs> I promise not to eat it, at least through the first part of the message. Well, um, sometimes, oh, let me, uh, I forgot my mind. Okay, there we go. Um, when you are uh, going through a letter like we are, First John, it, 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 it doesn't get repetitive in a sense, but when you decide to break it up like we are the five principles, and then we, we learned the first principle last week, and now we're going to learn the next principle, uh, to kind of get back into it, you almost have to review. Maybe you've seen a show where there's a part two, and when you get there, they kind of review part one. They kind of go over what you saw already because it's been a week or whatever, and you might have forgot it, and that will be the case here too as we will just touch not everything we touched last week, but just enough to give us uh, where, where we left off because these five principles are crucial. We mentioned that principles in the Scripture are so important because that is what guides us and tells us and corrects us. So if you have, uh, like GPS, GPS tells you, turn right, and uh, if you miss the right, it recalculates. And principles are those driving buoys, so to say, those, those flags that keep us between the these and thous of the scriptures so that we don't waste our life by getting off onto a rabbit trail. These principles, they're solid. They don't change. The, the principles that we find in the Old Testament or in the New Testament are as relevant today as they were then. Just the story around it isn't the same as what we're going through today. But the principles transcend time. And so when we start learning these principles, like five principles about my assurance of salvation, these things are important because they need to be uh, staked in our life and they need to uh, be applied to our lives so that we do not doubt. That we do not doubt. Because we will doubt. Because we're human. And even John the Baptist, he said, as right before he was going to get his head cut off, he said, uh, hey, listen, when the disciples come, are you sure this is the one? I mean, and they said, yes, he's the one. And they repeated all the things that were taking place there because sometimes it's overwhelming. We are in a fallen condition still. And sometimes life can just get a little bit too much. You ever been there? Where it's just sometimes it's just like, you've got to be kidding me. What more can I go through right now? But God is able by these principles to keep us where we need to be. All righty, let's open up with a word of prayer. Father, thank you now as we uh, shift our minds. We're constantly shifting our minds. We live in a generation that is busy. Uh, the, the automation that has been created through technology has not saved time, but in some cases has made our lives more complicated because we receive so much information from so many different places that we just sometimes are just too busy. Uh, Father, help us to lay those all aside. Though they are important and though we appreciate communication, we need to just hear one communication today, and that's the Holy Spirit. May we learn and understand and, and put part of our life, the precious promises to the believers today to help us in this journey that we're on. Every generation has hit hard times, difficult times in the world, difficult times in their nation, difficult times in their families. But Father, you have seen us through it, and we're thankful, thankful that you're on the throne and that we can learn even more about you. Thank you for our writer. Thank you for the human penman that was certainly inspired by the Holy Spirit, was bore along to write exactly what we need to know. Now, Father, help us today as we will face many things in our life. Help us to grow more in our Christ-likeness. And so we pray just as many did. Even so, come quickly, Lord Jesus. And we are excited about your appearing in the clouds one day. Maybe today. We don't know, but maybe today. Thank you now, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So let's go look at our text again. And we are in chapter number four. And uh, John is carefully laying precept upon precept. 
and line upon line. He is such a good author. He's such a good teacher. He's, uh, you, you sit underneath his teaching, and, 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 and he just is careful. And I like careful teachers. And so we will start in verse number 12 and read to 21, and then we'll pick up where we left off uh, last week. Uh, verse number 12 of 1 John chapter number 4. No man has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God dwelleth in us, and his love is perfected in us. Hereby know we that we dwell in him, and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. We learned that last week. The, the abiding, the, 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 the spirit that lives within us to guide us in all truth, and the assurance we have because of that. And we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believe the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Herein is our love made perfect that we may have boldness in the day of judgment because, of he, because as he is, so are we in the world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear have torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If any man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loved God love his brother also. So as we continue on, John once again is careful, and with great compassion for all believers, he is giving us a line by line and precept by precept, some principles that will help us when that doubt comes knocking. So he's laying, like we said last week, Isaiah 28, 10, for precept, must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. And so John pulls from the wealth of all that he witnessed being with Christ and pens it under the great remembrance of the Holy Spirit, giving him and supervising and, and superintending as he writes on us these principles that we need to help us in this life. In John chapter uh, uh, 4, as we've been reading, he gives five principles for us to understand the doctrine of the assurance of our salvation. John writes this epistle, this love letter to us, because he knows that it's not when, but, uh, or not if, but when doubt might fill our hearts. Now, I don't know each one of you personally enough that we have sat down and said, have you ever doubted your salvation? But maybe you're sitting here and you said, yes, there are many times that I have doubted my salvation. And, and John knew this would happen. It is one of the chief uh, 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 difficulties that uh, the, the false teachers try to sow in among the believers is the basic doctrines. And one of that is the assurance of salvation. If he can knock us off um, our assurance of salvation, uh, he's gone a long way to stop or slow down the progression of the church. So John's writing this for us. He's putting line upon line. Now today, John will go a little further in our understanding. He will lay out the second of the five principles found in the text so that when doubt comes knocking, we have the Word of God, the rhema. We have the Logos, that's all 66 books, but then we have the rhema, the, the verses that we can go to and say, wait a minute, this is what God says. Doesn't matter what you say, doesn't matter what the world says, this is what God says. So our theme, our five principles, our first one last week was understanding the indwelling of the Spirit, and that was in verse number 13. And today we'll, um, we'll, we'll talk about the assurance of the, um, um, uh, of the apostles authenticating uh, in the scriptures who Christ is. And, and we'll, we'll cover that in verse number 14. So John is teaching this truth because the Gnostics, 
false teachers have crept in and they've stirred up doubt with their uh, erroneous teaching. They have just sown seeds. Uh, John knows without a firm understanding of the assurance of salvation, it will cause the mission of the church to be stagnant and the unity of the body to have schisms. It's amazing how he takes just the, the ABCs, the very easy doctrines that we all ought to know and understand, and that's what he gets us off on. And one of those, of course, is the assurance of salvation. And we certainly see that in the church today. The basic doctrines are neglected. The first oracles of doctrines are untaught and causing a dearth and a confusion of the purpose of the local church today. The Bible tells us in Hebrews 5, 12, and 13, and we mentioned this um, last week, for when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat. For everyone that, that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Today we will look at the second principle taught by John on the doctrine of assurance of salvation. Of course, as we said last week, the object of your faith must be in Christ alone. John is talking to the believers. He's talking to those that have already come to faith. So if you're here today and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you have never ever put your faith and trust in Him alone for the forgiveness of sin. That must take place first. And we mentioned this last week, is that uh, there is an unwelcome visitor, and that is death, and is surely going to visit each and every one of us. We saw that this week, as many people launched out into eternity throughout the world. Every one of us will be ushered into eternity. Death is always successful in its mission because of the curse of disobedience. We are all moving towards physical death because of the fall of mankind. Now, we're all going to die physically, but we can be rescued spiritually. We can be made alive because of the cross of Jesus Christ. After physical death, the scripture says, comes the judgment and eternity's future. There's nothing more important than knowing for sure when death claims me, I'll be brought into the very presence of the Lord rather than the abyss where I'll be consigned to hell, a place that is godless and lost forever. For those of us who are born again, we must grow in our walk with Christ so we too uh, may have confidence in our assurance of salvation. We talked about this a lot last week. Won't go too much into it, but if you're not growing in your Christ-likeness, then it's like drinking milk all the time and you will not get the meat of the word to have that confidence um, as, as we're to have as we learn more about the doctrines of the scriptures. God wants his believing children to have a relationship of restful assurance in him. We quoted these verses, but I wanted to add a few more to them this week, and then we'll launch into our second principle. Last week we looked at 2 Peter 1, 9, but he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off, and have forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So we know that if you're not growing in Christ's likeness, Satan has an upper hand to get us into doubt or chasing our tail if we're really saved or not. So what he says then later, we didn't have time to cover it last week, but in verses 10, 11, and 12 of 1 Peter, he goes on and says, Wherefore, because of the statement I just made, wherefore the rather, brethren, give Diligence. That word diligence means haste. Make it a priority. Do you have any priorities today? Do you have some things that you are going to get done today, you hope? Or do you have some priorities for this upcoming week? You probably have a set of things that you know that need to get done. And, and, and Peter's saying the same thing. Hey, listen, if you're not going to doubt and, and, and you're going to grow, then give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ. Wherefore, I will be not negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. 
So Peter says, listen, everything I've mentioned in 2 Peter chapter 1, this is what you need to be doing all the time. Make it important, and if you do, you will have the confidence and the boldness to believe God's Word. That once saved, always saved. No matter what your lot in life is, no matter what takes place, God is the keeper of His promises. Now, I don't keep all my promises, do you? We can't. We're human. But God always keeps His promises. So God does not want His people left in a quagmire of uncertainty. John's who epistle is filled with tests for us to take gives us a little bit more this week so we can have that assurance of salvation. So last week we covered the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And this is what we said in just real short terms here. A Christian is someone who, in whom Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit indwells the believer. Um, and that is a staggering reality. That, that, that the Holy Spirit upon regeneration lives within us and has sealed us to the day of redemption. It's the hope that we have. It is a confident hope. Hereby, the Bible says in 1 John 4, 13, Hereby know we that we dwell in Him and Him and He in us because He has given us His Spirit. He has not left us comfortless. He has given us the Holy Spirit, which is God, to help us to learn more about Him. Now remember, we didn't cover this last week, but I was thinking about this this week, so I wanted to add this paragraph in before we jump into the to the next principle. Remember, don't make the mistake of thinking of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that somehow getting more of the Spirit into us it, 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 that, that we, we need to have or that we could receive Him by uh, installments or a second blessing or laying on of hands to receive a special anointing. In other words, you have all the Holy Spirit you need at the moment you were saved. There's not an installment. Oh, well, now I need more, and so I'm waiting for this second blessing or this laying on of hands or this special anointing or, or something that's uh, kind of bizarre. And that's what the Gnostics were saying. The moment you got saved, you got all the Holy Spirit that you needed. The difference is, is we need to not quench the Holy Spirit. We need to yield to Him so that we can be filled with the Spirit. Now think of it this way. Um, think of your life as an empty glass and you either fill it with yourself or you fill it, allow the Spirit to fill it. And so when we're living selfishly, when we're living for ourselves, then it gets all mucked up. The Holy Spirit is, is, is masked, so to say. And we're to uh, mask ourselves so the Holy Spirit can be unmasked and fill us and control us. We are to allow the Holy Spirit to control our mind, our thoughts, our movements, our decision are all by Him. And so as we yield to Him, He fills us, and of course we grow in our Christ-likeness. So the problem isn't that we need more of the Holy Spirit. The problem is we need less of us, because we're very controlling. We like things our way done the way that we think they ought to be done. Now, the second principle that we'll go through today is the assurance of the apostolic authentication the apostles uh off uh, um, of the uh, i'm sorry i just brushed my teeth here i can't do anything with them authentication of what we learn and we find that in verse number 14 let's read it together first john 4 14 and we have seen and do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Savior of the world. That's a declarative statement. John opens his letter with the same truth as we just read in our text. If we go back all the way to 1 John chapter 1 and verse 1, he says the same thing. Let's read it together. In 1 John 1, 1, he says, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled the word of life. And so John is still using that same doctrinal statement. The reality declares by the apostles um, 
is, uh, and, and, and expected to, for all believers to believe, is saying that we have seen and do testify, and John affirms the testimony of the original eyewitnesses was grounded in their personal experience. It was not a, 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 a philosophy that they were trying to bring in, but they experienced the Lord Jesus Christ. They walked with him, they talked with him, and they are testifying that it is true that God did send his son to be the savior of the world. The verb have seen denotes a close and careful observation. And also it is in the perfect tense indicating that, that an abiding impact of what they had observed. In other words, when the apostles are writing the scriptures, they are writing it from a firsthand knowledge and the impact that it had on them and the change in their life was so powerful and so life-changing that they are writing to us that this is the answer. Because God sent his son Jesus to be the savior of the world that we can have life and the promise of everlasting life. This impacted them. In their association with the incarnate son, which they saw with their own eyes and the outworking of his redemptive mission, uh, they are able to write it to us today. What they beheld produced in them an abiding conviction concerning his true identity. This was just not a man. This was the Son of God. This was God. He was that promise. There was no the miracles we saw, the time that we spent with him. There was no doubt they are telling us a witness of this to us today that he is God and that Jesus did come and died for our sins. The Christian life rests upon the acknowledgement or the acknowledging reality of God's revelation of himself in his son and a personal acceptance by faith of the son's unique person and work on our behalf. And so as John is relaying to now us uh, generations later and also at that time was that Christ was not merely man. But he was the Son of God, and he was the promise, and he was able to atone for our sins. And when he did say that he left a comforter with us, that it is true, and that we can know because he was God, that we too are in him. And because we are in him, then we have the confidence that he will come back for us one day. And that is what John is trying to, to, to drive home here. See, the Christian faith is built on the impregnable rock of whom Jesus is and what God has done through Jesus Christ that it is written down in the scriptures so that when we get saved, we have all that we need. Our sins are forgiven past, present, and future. We're sealed with the Holy Spirit and that we have eternal life with the Lord. The acceptance of this message is a test of doctrinal orthodoxy. This is what God says. He tells us not to have fear. He tells us to trust his word, that, that he holds us, and that the spirit will grow us, and as he grows us, we'll have confidence in the assurance of our salvation. We have to believe the historical acts of the living God's redemptive, redemptive act. We are building our lives in the historical facts of redemption that God did die for us. His son was fully a man and fully God. And Jesus did do the work that needed to be done through Christ. When a sinner puts their dependence by faith through grace upon Jesus Christ, we are believing in the historical acts of the living God's redemptive plan. And that is to seal us and to keep us for all eternity so john is building on what he already told us not only are you sealed with the holy spirit not only is he guiding you but that all came uh, uh came came to pass because the son died on the cross to be our savior when we are born again we were adopted into god's family we are no longer in man's family. We're no, no longer part of Adam's family. We are in a new race, and that new race has a plan for us, and, he, and, and that is to be with him forever and ever. 
Now, the Gnostics were creeping in and saying, no, 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 that's not the way it is. You have to have this special revelation. You have to have this force. You have to, have, uh, you, you, you have to go through certain things to, uh, and hope you get to heaven. But that's not the case here. The Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 2, and he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Christ died for our sins. And because he did, his, his atonement is not limited. Those of us that are saved, our sins are forgiven, and we do have a home in eternity. John is saying in verse 14, we can believe and depend upon this uh, apostolic testimony of Christ, that it is true. There are eyewitnesses of what took place. We have not seen Christ with our eyes, but we can rely on his word rather than, than feelings if we're saved or not. His word says we are. He did come. He did die. He was buried and he did rise from the dead and we can trust him and his redemptive acts. And then the assurance, the assurance of salvation grows the more we sink our entire lives into God, into his glory, into his son, into his word. So the more that we understand what took place in our life and how the Holy Spirit is changing us, the more that we grow in Christ, the more confidence and assurance that we have. Are you doing that? Are you, are, are you living your life unto God? Are, are, you, are you sinking your time into know Him better and to get these principles into your life? See, we need to grow in His Word. And the more we center on God, the more we'll grow in our sanctification. And the more that we have daily reminders of assurance of salvation, which will never be dependent upon me, but on His truth. So God says, it's not only the witness, but my word. Not only did the apostles write exactly what they saw and experienced, which is great, but even a greater witness is my word. In fact, when we depend upon his word, it is greater witness than if we were there at the, as a very eyewitness ourselves. So we need both. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verse number 16, For we have not followed cunning, devised, devised fables when we made known unto you the power and the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. That's a pretty powerful. It's a powerful thing to say that you were there, that they saw what took place. They met with the master every day, and because of that testimony, it helps us. But it is his word that assures us. Historical records are nice, but they are not absolute truth. There were times the apostles needed the spirit to refresh their memories so that the word of God is perfect and without error. We tend to forget and not be accurate in the details. Those of you that read a lot of history, you got to be careful. I read a lot about Churchill. But when Churchill wrote his, uh, his, his, his historical facts of World War II, he wrote them the way he wanted everyone else to think. And so if you really go back and look, he wasn't very accurate at times. Sometimes he wanted it to be this way, but not the scriptures. The scriptures are reliable. They, we, we can take them to the bank and that is, the, that is what uh, John's trying to drive home here. Not only are we sealed with the Holy Spirit, but also we have the witness of the apostles. The historical record. God's word is perfect. It's a more sure word of truth. And we can trust what we read is absolute truth. That is why there is such an assault on the word of God. Everywhere we go, the Word of God is, 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 is dumbed down or is changed into other versions. But God's Word is perfect, and we can trust it as absolute truth. That's why Satan works every moment to keep you from the truth. Yesterday, we attended a funeral, my wife and I. Her cousin passed away at a young age, 52. And while we were there, uh, uh, the very uh, Catholic uh, background there and and uh, as we sat through that service, uh, certainly the, the, the priest, I don't remember what his name was, but the priest was very charismatic. 
He was very outgoing. He was very personable. He was easy to listen to. And a lot of what he said grabbed my attention. You know, just listening to him because he had that ability to capture you. He spoke very well. At times he made you laugh. And uh, he was serious at times. He was very passionate. But when he got to the doctrine, he was way off. He would say things like this. I am betting my whole life that this is true. I hope it's true. I hope to see my loved ones one day. So it was not the surety of the apostolic uh, witness that we had. It was not the firmness of God's word, but what he thought and what he hoped. And John's saying, no, 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 that's not what we're taking. We have the word and the witness that says it is true. So we're not hoping to get to heaven. We know we're saved because we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and he has changed us through the Spirit. So I am confident that I am a different person, not that of myself, but because of the apostolic witness and testifying that Christ died in my place. And I have the word. In fact, uh, as the priest went on, it, it, it got a little bit more, a little crazy in trying to under, understand him. But, but because he was so charismatic and because he was such an easy person to listen to, everybody was agreeing with what he said. Never once was a scripture quoted. Never once was the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ preached for the forgiveness of sin. So people left there with hope of, I hope too, instead of a confident hope of what the scriptures say. And so the word of God is so important because take creation. Were you there at creation? No, nobody was. But yet we have an account of it because we trust his word is more sure. And so we have his word and we can see that in six days God created the world and on the seventh he rested and we believe it because we have a sure word that everything that we find in the scriptures have come to pass so we can believe on how creation took place. And what about all future promises? Have you died yet and gone to heaven? No, but we believe we will. Why? Because God's promises are sure. His word is powerful. We believe them because his word is trustworthy. So the, apost the, uh, um, the, the apostles writing are sure because they were inspired by God and, and, and God breathed and, and, and bore them along. And so when we see the scriptures, we are confident that we are born again, that we are. This is in a powerful text right here. If you take your Bibles and turn to 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, 20, and 21. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 19, 20, and 21. Now, I don't know about you, but there's sometimes I like to go back in history and actually witness what took place. Sometimes that's in a spiritual realm, as well as maybe, maybe, maybe a battle or, or maybe something that took place. Maybe, maybe I'd be there to see my dad in his childhood, and see if he obeyed his parents. And my dad told me this, and I'd like to go back and find out if it's true. My dad said that he walked to school uphill both ways. And sometimes he said he didn't have shoes. I want to go see if that's true. I want to go see if that's true. I want to see how many times he got grounded. And, uh, but, but sometimes we'll go back. But, but look what 2 Peter uh, in, in chapter 1, 19, 20, and 21 says. It says, we have also a more sure word of prophecy. Now, if you back up, what's taking place is they're talking about the transfiguration where Jesus appeared on the mountain. And so there's Jesus in his glorified state before the apostles, and there's Moses and Elijah as well. And, and he goes on here, and Peter says, We have a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto we, ye do well that you take heed as unto light that shineth in a dark place, until the laying down and the day star arise in you. So here he says, The word of God is even more sure than if you were there and saw it. That's how powerful God's word is. Why is it so powerful? Because it's alive. It, 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 you are who you are today because of the word. You keep changing because of the word. It's the word that changed you, not me, 
not somebody else. You read the word and the Holy Spirit uses that to change you into the image. And that's what John's driving home here is it's great for the witness, but this is even more powerful. God's word. It says, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. For the prophecy came not in old times by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So God's word is powerful. It changes everything. It gives us hope. It gives us the future. We have confidence to keep on keeping on because we see God's hands fulfilled in prophecy over and over and over and over again. So we fear not. We don't fear. We know the outcome. We know that we win. We know that we'll be in his presence. We, we have that assurity from the apostles' witness, but then also the word of God. So if you're here today and you do not know Christ as your Savior, and you're not sure where you'll spend eternity, then you can be assured that God's word is clear on the gospel. And that is that Christ died in our place so that our sins could be forgiven and that we could have a home in eternity because there is no way that you can take care of your sin on your own. There's no way. It's impossible. You have no ability within yourself to make yourself righteous before God. You can't do it. You just can't do it. There's no way. But the scripture says there is a way, and that way is through Christ alone and the work on Calvary. So when you say, wait a minute, you telling me that, that, that if I don't get uh, my sins forgiven now when I die, I'll spend eternity separated from him? Yes, that's what the scriptures say. But you today could put your faith and trust in Christ alone and have your sins forgiven and know for sure that you'll spend eternity in heaven. Why? Because his word says so. Why? Because we have a more sure prophecy. The word of God. Boy, what would we do without the word? I was talking to Dale yesterday and he was teaching me and I really appreciated it. He was teaching me a lot on what that word hope means and that it's not a hope to but a confident hope, a confident hope. Why? Because we see God time and time and time again fulfill the prophecies exactly as he says he would. And so, so John, John is teaching us then not only the um, apostolic witness that we have and, 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 and the word of God, we have the word of God that is powerful, powerful. So God gives his amen upon the eyewitnesses by inscriptinating, and that is not a word. I tried to figure out how do you say that, inscriptinating, and so I, I, I think I created a new word. I'm going to call Webster today. And by inscriptinating, it kept wanting to change it to two words. All he has to say to us is in a written form, and he opens to us and reveals it to us through his word, all we need to know about the Lord Jesus Christ, and the future. That's why we're so confident. We're so confident not because we think we're arrogant. We're so confident because we know the Creator. And God is able to keep His promises. And so this is a second principle for us. It's not only that the Holy Spirit lives within us and we see things taking place in our life that have changed us, into the image of Christ, not of ourselves, that's a miracle right there. But then also future promises we see in his word, and that builds confidence as we see uh, th uh, through our life, especially in the day and age we live in, we see prophecy after prophecy after prophecy being fulfilled. So when I hear the world's all upside down, I get a little giddy because we're that much closer. When I see the birth pains... When my wife started getting closer and closer to that birth, I was getting more and more excited. We were finally going to meet this child, finally. And, and, and because the birth pains were getting closer, there were certain things. She started to nest. She started to get things organized. There was, there was something in her that was moving to tell her that it was time. And we see that in the world today. Those of you that are born again, you know you are what you are today, not because of yourself. There's no doubt about it. You cannot somehow justify that you did this. This was a gracious work of the Lord Jesus Christ. 
So our life is secure and grows in assurance as we build upon God's word of what he has done and what he has said. Because of the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus Christ promised in Genesis 3.15, we have confidence that we're in his hands. What God has spoken in other areas as well and what God's promises of the future events. There's a combination of this timeless truth. I don't want to keep going back to that funeral, but it was just so obvious that I think everyone that left there probably did not leave with confidence of of salvation. They just went hoping that they would get there one day. So maybe they left thinking, i got to work a little harder. But we don't work harder. We rest in the work of Christ. And that's why we are sure of the assurance of salvation. Now next week we'll we'll cover our third principle. And it will be uh, found in 1 John 4.15. Let's look at that in case you want to get ahead and start to look at it. And uh, the Bible says in um, 1 John 4, verse 15, that will be our third principle. It says, Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him and he in God. And we're going to kind of unfold that, um, that statement that is made there by the Savior. So now we'll see a very plain statement next week. If you by grace receive Christ as the object of your faith, him alone, all your hope is in him, Uh, and your foundation is in him, and all your righteousness is from him, and the imputed righteousness is in you, God has promised to indwell you with confidence by the abiding relationship. And we'll talk about that um, next week. So here's here's um, here's the invitation for today. You're here today, and you're born again, then then grow in Christ. The more you grab on and dig deeper into the word, the more confidence you'll get because you'll understand truth better. And so that when doubt comes, you can go right to the scripture and say, no, 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 this is what God says. And God's always right because God is the creator. He's the one that holds my life. I don't hold my own life. I'm not holding on to him. He's holding on to me. I am sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. He will never leave me nor forsake me because I am his child. And so that doubt then will go away. Now it might come back again, because Jesus said that when he was tempted in, John, in, um, in um, Matthew 4, when he was tempted in the wilderness, he said the devil left him for a season. <laughs> it keeps coming back, and we keep using the same verses. And of course he flees. So maybe, maybe, maybe if you have any doubts, you need to grow in the word so that you will not have those doubts. And then also, if we are growing in, in, in grace, then this church can accomplish the mission that it has for it for Hampshire. We work in unity of the Spirit, and because of that assurance, and we're all on the same page, and we realize that this world cannot touch us unless God allows whatever to touch us, we can accomplish what needs to be done here. We don't want to be just pew setters. We want to get out as well and turn our world upside down. But maybe that's not your situation today. Maybe yours is, you're just not born again. If you died today, you are not 100% sure where you spend eternity. You just don't know. You're not sure. You never really thought about it. It hasn't been something that has maybe come up in your mind, but today the Holy Spirit's working on you and you realize, wait a minute, I don't know where I would spend eternity. And maybe that's bothering you. Today you could be saved. Today you could come and uh, see in the scriptures what God says about eternal life. I hope, I hope one of those two things need to take place. Would you just close your, your eyes and bow your heads? I typically don't do the invitation this way, but I'm going to do it this way today. If you're here today and you say to me, um, Pastor Kuntz, I know for sure that I'm born again. There's no doubt about it. Everyone's eyes are closed. I'm sure. I know I'm born again. I have received Christ as my Savior, Him alone. I understand it, and I know I'm born again. Would you just slip up your hand if that's you? Just slip it nice and high. That's great. That's great. A lot of hands, but not all hands. Not all hands, but a lot of hands. You're here today, and I certainly won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. I won't call your name out. I won't yell or jump or anything. But if you're here today and you say, you know what, I am not sure where I spend eternity, just pray for me. Just slip your hand up and put it right back down. Just slip it up and put it right down. Put it right back down. Just slip it up. 
I see that hand. Now, maybe that's you. You're just not sure, but today you can know for sure. If the Spirit's working in your heart, then why not inquire? Why not find out for sure if you're in the household of faith? Wouldn't that be something that you ought to at least, at least take a look at the claims of Christ? So whatever your need is, you come. Miss Eve is going to play, and as she plays, uh, you can sit in your seat, you can look up, you can open your eyes, you can read your Bible, you can do whatever you want to do. But think, what is the Lord doing in your heart? What needs to change? Are you still drinking milk? If you're drinking milk, you're going to constantly be doubting your salvation. If you're here today and you're not saved, you could get up right now, come forward here and Take me by the hand. I'd love to show you how you can know Christ as your Savior. Or maybe after the service, you come to me and I could sit down and just explain to you what the Scripture says. If you feel uneasy, that's the Holy Spirit convincing you of your need of salvation. Can play through one more time and then we're going to transition to the Lord's table today. up here we're going to have the Lord's table um, Mr. Phil was going to help me he wasn't feeling very well so I don't like to do this um, I like this but Sam I'm going to need you to come up and, and help me for the Lord's table if you would if you could come up here yeah because um, Phil was not feeling very well so um, we're going to have the Lord's table if you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your Savior then you can partake in it and we'll be glad to have that remember that the Lord's table is a time of self-examination just uh, taking time to remember uh, the broken body and the blood that was shed for us and and uh, to be in a right relationship with him as we take it uh, and the covenant that we have in the New Testament so these men will pass the elements there's no saving grace in them uh, they do not change your state with the Lord It is a time of remembrance of what God has already done in our lives and so as you, as we uh, pray for each one of the elements, and then as we pass them, it's time for you to examine yourself as you take the Lord's table, as we take it together as, as a group. So I'm going to have um, um, uh, um, Dale, if you would, would you pray for the, um, the cup? Amen. Amen. Okay, men. Here you go. Just for one side. Thank you, Sam. Thank you.
good one as well. Okay. The scriptures tell us in 1 Corinthians chapter number 11, he said, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which was broke, broken for you, this do remember me. And after the same manner, he also took the cup when he had supped, saying, This is the cup of the New Testament, my blood, that you do as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. So we will take the cup at this time. And at this time, we'll pass the bread. And would you pray for the bread? Once again, he said, For I have received the Lord that which I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he break it and say, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. That concludes uh, the service today, and I... I pray that uh, it has helped you in the area of principles of the assurance of salvation. And I hope you have a good afternoon and a good week. And on Wednesday, we have a Bible study here at 6.30 to 7.30. And you certainly you're invited to come. We have a children's program. It's dedicated just to children between uh, uh, K-5 or K-4 to 5th grade. And then on Sunday night, tonight, there's a program for teenagers, those that are 6th grade uh, all the way to 12th grade, and you're certainly welcome to come. Father, thank you now for the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for the gift of one another. What a, what, what a wonderful gift it is to, to know others that we can fellowship with and be encouraged around and to help us grow in our Christ-likeness. Now, thank you. Bless us. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. All right, you are dismissed. Amen.